If you can't play Lagrima beautifully, why could you play something that involves three voice counterpoints with imitation well? I mean, you're getting the right notes at the right time. Congratulations, that's level one. All the beauty is when we transcend the technique and get the musicality and singing out of the guitar. You have these people who can, yeah, play the box or cone from memory and flawlessly. And then you say, hey, now play Happy Birthday or like, you know, in, in key of C major and they can't do it. You know, this is a crisis. There are like thousands of people out there who've been told that if you cannot play with nails, you just don't, don't even try to play classical guitar. You're not a serious player. This is historically incorrect and nonsense, in my opinion. The classical guitar world is in a bit of crisis in the sense that people are these incredible musical athletes, these technicians, but I'm surprised sometimes how... Hey friends, welcome to Oh Sheet, the podcast where I talk to inspiring and awesome people about music, art, guitar, and everything we love. Today, it's my immense pleasure to talk to Brandon Acker, a classical guitarist and expert in early plucked instruments. He's probably the most trusted classical guitar content creator on YouTube with over 500,000 subscribers. Brandon and his wife created Arpeggiato, an online music school for plucked instrument enthusiasts. And additionally, Brandon's classical guitar online course has attracted over 1,100 students globally, showcasing his dedication to musical education and performance. Today's episode this episode was kindly sponsored by the Dario, but we're going to talk about them a little bit later. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad we finally get to to meet. Uh, I know we've been like commenting uh, on each other's videos, and it seems like we yeah. we both watch each other's content, and like in in many ways we're kind of doing similar things. And uh, I really like that, and it's it's really great to see kind of you know what you're working on and the, and the projects you're doing and experimentations and things like that. So uh, congrats on on your videos. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. As I. I think I said this already to Eva and Evan on the previous episodes, but it feels like we already know each other a little bit. So when we hop on a call like this, it's just, I don't know, it's not like talking to a stranger, to, to meeting someone for the first time, but totally. it's just like connecting to a friend. And that's great. Exactly. That's, that's one of the huge benefits of social media and this, this new era of, I, t I don't know, let's call them, let's call it internet guitarists and being internet guitarist a little bit. This Absolutely. is actually something I wanted to explore today with you. And uh, I was thinking how basically when you started sharing your music on YouTube, I think first you started posting music videos, right? You started posting mm. them like 12 or 10 years ago. And yeah, you only yeah. posted music videos, right? For, for most of my YouTube career, it's been uh, just performance videos. That was all I mm -hmm. ever intended it to be. It was just, uh, I knew there was this thing called YouTube and I just threw stuff up there because I, I had it. And then... Uh, I fear you. Yeah, you know, it's just like an easy way to share a link or promote. And I was trying to navigate the, the murky waters of, okay, I'm like switching from being a rock metal guitarist into classical guitar. I see people, classical musicians have like, you know, nice performance videos. Maybe I need some of those. And so I'd, I'd get a camera and like film a recital I did or something and uh, just throw it online and maybe maybe this would help my like promoting myself as a concert playing you know guitarist or something and then I had no ambition there and no idea of um, what YouTube really was or that it could be um, something more than just a, a you know a place to deposit <laughs> your your performance videos so uh, yeah that yeah. was m most of my time was just just doing that that's funny. It's quite similar to what I had with uh, Reddit. Um, I started mm. streaming, live streaming on Reddit right in the middle of pandemic. And the idea was to just share my music, to just put things out there, you know, throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, and I had no idea how it can become something bigger or how it could ever become such a strong part of my life and mm. over time you know i learned that it's not just about putting music out there and i learned i don't know i i became part of a community i became friends with other guitarists i met nice. with i don't know um hobby players and it just became such a nice thing which i never expected yeah, isn't that the the most incredible thing i mean you know yeah. we both i think uh, are, are are you know similar uh ages and, and like, like i probably like came you know had discovered this world of you know the internet being a bigger and bigger part of our, our our lives and i don't know i think that there was a shift that happened i remember thinking the youtube was like basically about you know cute cat videos and 
you know it's almost <laughs> like you know america's funniest home videos just like little funniest little uh, funny little things and then um and then suddenly and let's play videos right and then suddenly <laughs> i think i i think it was around the time that i ended up in college around 2008 for classical guitar and and uh suddenly i, I was finding like, like amazing um lectures and like academic things and I, I was like learning and then it replaced my tv and so mm -hmm. as like a you know just a, before i ever was doing this i was just uh, consuming it all the time and i don't have i haven't had a tv since i moved out of my parents place when i was you know 17. oh really yeah because i didn't feel i needed one i mean the, for me youtube was this infinite resource uh mm -hmm. without the commercials uh, well back then there was no <laughs> no no ads uh -huh. and you could just like walk watch you know it was like this amazing roulette thing of like, what am I going to find next and discovering more about the world? And so actually a lot of my, I would say like music appreciation for opera, for classical music has come from, from YouTube. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I just wanted to grab the opportunity to um, do a little fangirl link here because I think your channel and uh, also Alexandra Wittingham's channel mm. were one of the biggest, or th these channels had maybe the biggest influence to shape my uh, channels and to jumpstart, you know, my things online. And wow. what you were doing or what you are doing, especially in the past couple of years on YouTube, have, I don't know, you just have had a huge influence on, on what I do now. So I, I wanted to mm. say thank you for making these videos. And as I said, especially, I think you started to share more educational content in the past four years. Yeah. I think those are the videos that made you one of the most reliable online source in the classical guitar community because obviously you have maybe you have one of the biggest uh channel you know by subscriber count or subscriber numbers and while you know subscriber numbers we don't consider them as you know pure value as itself but they still have helped you to i don't know to be able to reach a lot of people and i keep hearing yeah. people in my community referencing your videos oh, and wow. it's just so much fun it's so good that's yeah. so cool i think uh i'm i'm as surprised as anyone uh that 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 has sort of happened um like i said i mean you know you, you don't go into it uh with a with that type of plan and uh I don't yeah, think I know, of course. I don't think I know anybody who who like has that plan, who like actually like has a channel that really I don't know snowballed into having a, a following. Almost everybody almost kind of somehow stumbles into it and make and turns it into something as it as it kind of grows organically. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean it's an amazing thing that I think there's a there's just a community of players out there craving knowledge, uh, being uh, who are super interested in learning about these topics, and I think YouTube channels like both of ours are these resources that I really wish I would have had my first year when I was switching to classical guitar. Like, I mean, there was a couple videos online, but they were not so great. There was very little educational content. Um, and what I'm discovering through the whole internet community thing is there's quite a lot of people out there who don't have access to a good education uh, where they live um, or they can't afford the education they, they want. And they could be a very, I, I, I've gotten emails from like, from parents who have incredibly prodigious kids who can who are oh my god this this, this nine-year-old is playing so wonderfully but they don't have a, a real you know classical guitar they they can't afford lessons they won't go to university it's like well like these videos are their way of learning that this is how they're doing it and so it's for people like them and just the, kind of the general community that i think there's a this is a thing we should be doing to kind of like spreading the the word about you know how can you not just improve on the instrument but, but also appreciate it to, at, a, at a greater, at a deeper, more profound emotional level. Yeah, and you know what I, as you said, I think you can't really go into this with the idea of building, I'm going to build an empire now and everyone's <laughs> going to subscribe to my channel because if you, I don't know, if someone goes into it with that thought, uh, it's. I have a feeling it's not going to last for too long or it's not going to lead anywhere because it's not, it's not coming from the genuine um, feeling that you want to do good for your community, for the people yeah. that are like you, for the people that you want to feel or that you want to have some responsibility for. Mm. And and yeah, what, what I like about your channel at the same time is how... So first of all, it has a lot of educational content. But whenever I watch a video, I don't feel like I'm watching a lesson, but I feel like I'm watching a guy 
talking about something that he really, really likes and really <laughs> enjoys. And somehow, eventually, I'm also learning something. And, mm. and I think that's, that's kind of the secret of YouTube. That's, that's what really works on social media, when you just genuinely, lo genuinely love what you're doing and yeah. people will catch, catch that. I completely agree. Um, that's the one, the one word I keep coming back to. And when I reflect on um, what this is and what works and what doesn't work, uh, is authenticity. You know, you mm -hmm. can't really fake being authentic. Um, and I think we've all seen enough kind of, kind of like news anchors, you know, who are just kind of like, you know, the, hello, good morning. And it's like kind of like this, you know, cartoonish <laughs> character that we no longer trust. And, you know, I, I think about the idea that even like um, big um, you know, companies selling products that are universally used in homes have switched from million dollar budget um, commercials with actors saying, this is my favorite product. I use this toothpaste every day, you know, this type of thing to uh, influencers yeah. at home with that are low budget that are people that are people who seem authentic and saying, hey, I actually like this. This is what I like about it. Like that's worth more. That's more, mm -hmm. that's better social currency than the million dollar um, fake video that we all know is fake in acting. And I think we've all kind yeah. of, we're overreacting. Maybe we're kind of a, on a spot of reacting against that. And now somehow just like kind of being in your home and saying what you really think is, is now considered a serious value for that reason. I think I agree. However, um, I think there's this problem around the word influence influencer. So sometimes I'm also being called as an influencer and because there is this negative feeling attached to it nowadays. Mm. It's, it's, I don't know, it's tough. I know, I know it's not a bad thing. And just by the, the meaning of the word is not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. It's supposed to be a good thing because you <laughs> have an impact. You yeah. influence people in a good way. But at the same time, I think the meaning we, we attach to it is uh, a little bit damaged by now. But yeah, that's just a minor thing. Actually, there's something I'm kind of struggling with lately. And I think I brought this up to Eva too, and I still haven't find anything, you know, to, I don't know. I just find it hard. Okay. I will just say it. I, <laughs> I find it hard sometimes to justify my videos. So lately hmm. I almost stopped making, um, entertaining content because I feel sometimes that I'm also addicted to my phone. I find it hard to leave it behind. I find it hard to Same. leave the house. And then I have this huge FOMO if I'm not sharing stuff on Instagram and I'm not putting out content. But at the same time, you want to produce high quality content. So I don't know. Sometimes I feel hard to think about, okay, I'm going to publish this video. But it has to be the best video I can make in order to justify robbing people's life, right? Because <laughs> they are paying with their most valuable currency, their time. Yeah. And that's a tough thing, I think. And I believe uh, educational content is right in the best place with this. Because when you make educational content, you are also feeling like you're giving back. You're not just taking, you're yes. not taking, you're giving back at the same time. So I feel, I feel really good about educational content on YouTube. Therefore, I don't know what you think about this. <laughs> oh, I think I struggle with the same thing. And, um, there's an idea that I, I really have been, uh, working through in my mind for some years now. Um, there's an idea called audience capture where the person who's producing the content, uh, pays a great deal of attention to the feedback they're getting from the people who are watching. So that could be your analytics, you know, retention rate, view counts. And like, basically the, the attempting thing to do, if you do this for a living, uh, is to start, um, changing your content based on what's working in the analytics. Uh, because what you're doing is you're actually, you're changing your content, not based on what your viewers want, but based on your perception of what they want based on these, these analytics. Um, and what you can do then is start doing things that are, that are, were authentic. And now you're making, I don't know, things that feel more like clickbait or things that are more, um, trendy, um, just because, just for the sake of getting views. But then you, then what are you now? You know, you're, you're a parody of yourself or you're doing an impression of, of what seems to be working for other people. And then you, you've left what was working so well, the, that makes you, you, that, that area. So. 
I find that's a, that's a struggle. And for me, I have, I have had the same realization that you did, which is the number one thing I know works and that I, I'm always, I always find meaning. I, I'm always happy about it. It's educational content because someone writes and they say, I had no idea about this. I love this now. I'm going to listen to more of this or I'm going to try this out. Um, we both did uh, videos about experimenting by cutting off our nails. And that's such an important topic because there are like thousands of people out there who've been told incorrectly that if you cannot play with nails, you just don't, don't even try to play classical guitar. You're not a serious player. This is historically uh, incorrect. And, and uh, in terms of what the guitar can do is just, it's, I don't know where it comes from, but it's, it's nonsense in my opinion. And unfortunately, it's led a lot of people to not pursue the classical guitar uh, because they have weak nails or they, they, for their job, they can't grow nails. And so when you make a video like that, that we both made, you're opening people's minds up and you're actually potentially uh, giving them the gift of saying, oh, this thing that I love to listen to, I can do this now. And now they can spend countless hours enjoying this thing. And so, and that's something that you can be involved in. And what's more meaningful than that? It, it becomes less about, look at me, uh, look how fast I can play. And which is like, there's one level of praise that feels good. And then it becomes like, oh, I gave you something that is going to help you in some way. And what's, what's better than that, you know? Yeah. And you can, you can be the person who plays, I don't know, Asturias the fastest <laughs> for a very short amount of time. Cause yeah. eventually <laughs> there's going to be, I don't know, a random kid who's playing it totally. just a little bit faster. And, you know, and then your video that or the thing you produced is going to be the second best or you, it's just not, not what you intended with it. You want it to be the fastest or the person who plays Asturias the fastest. And then, you know, a month later, you are not. But if your yeah. intention is to make a helpful video for someone, uh, even though there are a couple of other videos covering the same topic, it's still, it's still worth it because you have something, you see the same thing uh, slightly differently. You had different experiences. You can share yes. different perspectives. So it, it will never lose value just because someone else made a similar video, right? Absolutely. Actually, have you had this experience where, yeah, I, mean, I mean, as classical musicians, as musicians in general, I think it's really great to have many teachers. I've had like... Mm -hmm. 50 teachers, you know, I mean, if I include like the master classes and people I've studied with for, you know, maybe five lessons at a time, like 50 teachers. And uh, in some way, the way I play is a result of all, all 50 of them, little versions of themselves with all of their feedback yeah. and great ideas on my shoulders, filtered, synthesized through my personality. And then what, what you hear is a product of all, all of that. And somehow, sometimes um, you can hear the same thing from your teacher for 10 years and they can say, no, no, no. When you, when you do a hammer on, you're, you're not lifting high enough or you're straightening your finger and you can hear it again and again and again and still have it <laughs> wrong. And then suddenly a random guitarist comes in for a 30 minute masterclass and they say, no, think of your finger like a curled, well, they make a nice analogy. And suddenly uh -huh. you yeah. go, oh, why did my teacher never say that? And your teacher goes, I've been telling you that for 10 years and you didn't get it. <laughs> well, they just phrased it in a way that was different or they put it in a context with the right analogy. And it wasn't better on ver it's never better or worse. It's just yes. what resonance says with you. They were saying the same thing. Same thing, but yes. But that's so great. I mean, I, I think, and it's like, if if I have a video on tremolo and you have a video on tremolo and I have a video on no nails and you have a video on no, if it, that's great. People should watch both. I mean, it's not a competition. That's one beautiful thing I think about what we're doing as well as I, when, once you get in the land of education, we're not competing where well, everyone's kind of, um, you know, uh, contributing to the, to the uh, communal fountain, you know? Uh, yes. Yeah. It's a I agree. Thing. Um, I had this, I made a video about bar chords recently. I think it's my latest one. And, uh, and I shared it in the classical guitar subreddit. I like that subreddit. I like that community a lot. Uh, so I, I usually share stuff there. But now this video was a little bit attacked by just one person. It was very appreciated and, and everyone was super nice about it. But there was one person who asked, why am I making videos that was already made by, I don't know, 50 other people huh. um, and 
produced better so you know the the quality of the video was not perfect or it wasn't uh, as professional mm. i intentionally leave in mistakes in my videos to i don't know to create it's just my personality i like leaving mistakes in and like just uh, be this i don't know self just have this self-deprecating humor <laughs> and i i like it and so they pointed it out how why why, why am i making videos that were already made by a lot of other people. But mm. the truth is, even though you watch 10 Barkwards videos, you never watch the same video, even though it's about exactly. the same topic. It's so different every single time. It was funny. I, I had the thought, I remember I, I watched my, my mind go through a, 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 some stages when I, when I saw that you released a Barkwards video. Um, can, if you teach classical guitar or guitar in general, you, you will teach Barkwards, like, you know, thousands of times, and you will constantly encounter with the beginner guitarist so I, I've taught many styles, and inevitably, you things are going well, and they have to play their first F major chord or bar chord, and they run into a wall, and they, there's so much complaining going on, and I've spent so much time working people's hands and figuring out what is the thing about the bar chord. So I have my own thoughts about that. Every guitarist should should you know have a teacher should have like a a whole speech ready, um, and therefore <laughs> we all I mean because it's the most one of the most uh, complained about topics when people are starting these barriers mm -hmm. to to entry. So uh, I've been meaning to make a video about bar chords for, for a long time. I even, did, uh, instead of doing the video, I ended up doing a workshop at my online school. I had one of my teachers do a workshop. Oh, uh -huh. um, but the thing is, uh, and, I, and I've been thinking about doing one on, on YouTube, and I saw your video, and I had the initial thought. I was like, I was like, oh, she just released a video on bar chords. Maybe I should wait, because I've been thinking about filming one. I don't want to really release one too, too close and like, look like the same type of content. <laughs> and then the moment after I thought that, I thought the same thing you just thought. I was like, no, 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 that's not how this works at all. Even if I tried, like our videos would be nothing alike and uh, people should watch yeah. both. And and there's no, we're, we're not, we couldn't even say the same things if we sat there for an hour and talked about bar chords. And the only overlapping thing would be the things that work in the hand and what's good for people. So I think this is so healthy thinking this way. It's, we, we can't be uh, all competitors. Uh, we're all, yeah. Like I said, I, I like the the image of commu uh, contributing to the communal fountain. That's that's the way to do it. I think one of the experience I had this experience that helped me to put this into the right. I don't know to have a better mindset about this. And I think it was one year ago, one and a half. I don't know. You published something related to gut strings mm. i don't know it was a video about gut strings i don't know i don't remember exactly but i was streaming on twitch you know i was minding my own business i was playing practicing my silly little things and someone popped in the chat they said something you said about gut strings and asked me what my point of or what what do i think about it or what do I, what's my opinion about it and uh -huh. unfortunately i've never played gut strings so i couldn't really contribute but i realized how um people people who are interested in classical guitar they are going to consume um different sources or the same same ideas from different sources mm -hmm. and it's also a good thing that we can ask uh people what they think about or i don't know someone can ask you what do you think about my approach to bar chords or someone can ask me what do I think about I don't know Hannah Murphy's tremolo video and it's just or I mean not that video but what how do I approach the same topic and mm. these videos can create conversations exactly uh, I, I think you know it's one of these things where I'm if you release enough videos you have to get pretty thick skin you know because you're gonna get people will find a way to give you feedback no matter what you do but i think uh <laughs> <laughs> right i mean I've, I've encountered so much feedback that i never even knew was possible you know uh about my clothes or my hair or, you know everything you can possibly imagine um yes i know i feel you <laughs> yeah that, that's the reality of, of the internet but i think i think seeing past the the small percentages because that's the, the good news i mean i i can tell from from your comment section as well as mine that there's some type of the community that's watching those videos, there's a wholesome feeling to it where people are coming ready to learn and are genuinely interested. And then the random internet, you know, trolls pop in every once in a while. But I think 90 something percent of the reactions I, I see to genuine educational content. How could it be anything other than thank you and, and positivity? And so um, th there's clearly something really special about doing this. And so at the, I don't know about you, but at the moment I have no 
no intention of of stopping i, I i've only only good things have come from from doing this um so i'm just gonna kind of keep going and seeing where this you know this what this ride takes me do you have any goals or specific ideas in mind where i don't know directions yeah uh one thing i have in mind uh, is to uh really move to a to focusing on my online courses and my online school uh so my online course is called classical guitar pro and my school is called arpeggiato um the school is for like one-on-one -on -one lessons i have teachers who, who teach for me at the school and then and we do like live events and i have a uh, courses where people you know it's like pre-recorded watch at your own pace type of thing and what i've learned is that um so th both those both of those things didn't exist before covid they were kind of covid projects before that i was just doing concerts and youtube uh and, right. then, and then private teaching and uh what i've learned is that with the youtube thing um building up this community of people who are genuinely interested and want to learn there there's a limit to how much you can teach on youtube because i mean can i release a five hour video on youtube which is really what you have to watch if you want to um you know get something equivalent to several lessons worth of content i mean there's youtube is a medium which kind of pushes you in a direction like it, it ha you have to have like a retention rate you know like people have to keep people watching you know if you take an hour lesson with me there's no i don't i'm not worried about retention rate you know and i'm not worried about what one million people would think watching this i'm just i'm just engaging with the one person and if i published that whole video of a, of a whole lesson YouTube would find it super boring. It wouldn't be the right type of thing, but actually that's what people need to hear to actually improve. So I realized you have all of these thousands thousands of people, uh, millions of people who are interested in learning classical guitar, lute, whatever, you know, plucked instrument. But if they're only consuming the free YouTube videos that are that are made for YouTube, they can consume those five hours a day every day and they're never actually going to get mm -hmm. where they want to because that's not a curriculum. That's little supplementary videos that work that are going to help you. But you're not going to, if you don't, if you're not taking lessons, you don't have like an actual curriculum, that's just not going to get you where you want to go. So I realized that my goal is to actually change people's playing for the better and give them, um, hopefully, what I've, what I've learned in a way that's going to really improve their playing. And the way to do that is with online courses or private lessons. And so my new idea with my channel, speaking about this like long-term goal, is to produce enough online courses so several levels of classical guitar i have one volume out right now for a classical guitar beginner course that takes you from nothing all the way to your first recital like i, I go to a recital hall and you play the recital hall yeah recital i want to talk about this soon okay I, want, well, I have some questions i'll, sa I'll <laughs> save that then and then so that's a beginner course and i want to make an intermediate level which takes you to the next point and then, a, then advanced level supplementary uh -huh. courses a course on music theory rhythm reading music all the topics that people really struggle with and keep asking for in comments so I want to make all that available online and then with my with my teachers to do one-on-one -on -one lessons so that basically my YouTube channel is this supplementary is all these supplementary videos which I want to keep you know teaching people to appreciate music they might not have heard since I mainly play Baroque music uh, these days I want to really show them these beautiful instruments that I know about got strings temperaments playing without nails all these like cool ideas uh, reading from manuscripts um, and then I want to hopefully show people the good news of like look at all this cool stuff and then give them the next the next place to go if they're serious for those of mm -hmm. you who enjoyed this and just find it entertaining good you can stop here for those of you who want to go further here is how you would do it by giving the next series of um ways so that's kind of my 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 big macro goal at the moment is to really influence uh -huh. not uh, like millions of people not just for for views and and for them to be entertained for a minute but to actually change and give them the the way show them the the door so that they, they can actually play the music they want to play with good technique and, and musicality uh, so mm -hmm. that's that's the idea at the moment yeah that sounds great um thanks I had so many ideas. So I, I had so many questions while you were talking and okay. now I'm just trying to structure <laughs> everything time. I heard. With uh, so with YouTube videos it's like it's like an introduction to people to get interested mm -hmm. or to make them interested and make them want to learn more in a lighter way, right? That's the idea. Is that it's a soft entrance. It's a it's no okay. risk. It's 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 free. The videos are so compact. They're cut down for time to really keep your attention so that's the most possible entertaining you know version of an introduction mm -hmm. to classical guitar or lute or whatever it may be. 
to grab your attention to see, hey, maybe you're interested in this. Maybe, maybe you think you only like, like I did, I, you think you only like rock and metal, but have you even heard classical guitar? Do you know what this sounds like? Watch this. And I want to like get the people to come in and just, a lot of people will just leave immediately because they think this, what is this? They have preconceived notions, but then something, you know, some small percentage of people like you and I will be, will go, what is that? Wait, wait, you can do what? It sounds that beautiful. Why do I feel like crying? You know, this thing, this someone who just like instantly is now, uh, all in and they go, Oh, I have to learn how to do this. And then for those people, YouTube serves as the, one of the best ways to reach the most people to, um, just allow them the experience of appreciating this music. The people who would never buy a ticket to a concert. You know, they're walking down, they're on vacation, they have the day free, they're in a beautiful Italian city, and there's this concert hall right there with a sign that says, um, uh, whoever, you know, um, Anna Vidovich playing in, in 10 minutes. Uh, tickets are this much. And like, well, I, I do love guitar, but I like, I like Eddie Van Halen, so nope. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they wouldn't even go in presented the opportunity uh but on youtube there's no risk and so that can be the moment where you get people you, to say look look at this and then the people who will who will continue from there i want to give them the the path to show them easily um how to proceed actually i feel very similarly about choosing my repertoire i think so you are talking about this experience more from the educational perspective mm -hmm. but when I was when I started playing music online, as I told you, it was on Reddit in the middle of pandemic, mm. and I pulled up I don't know invocation and dance, and I started to play it for redditors. There was this system there when um, sometimes the algorithm just threw you on the front page, and you found yourself in playing for twenty thousand people, and the chat was it was crazy. <laughs> And so oh. I was like, okay, what am I, what, what should I play? Yeah. I could play Spanish romance, but I could play invocation and dance. Mm, invocation and dance sounds like a good idea to hook people into classical guitar. And it wasn't a good idea. Oh, no. <laughs> so over time, I found that there are a lot of pieces that are a little bit underappreciated in the academic, I don't know, community or atmosphere, but they are very, very good to well to hook people in that's not the nicest word to make people interested or to yeah. make people look look at you and and say oh this is nice i want to hear more and so i started to play a lot of uh, lighter pieces lighter program and i started to really like them because at first you know i i came in with this perception that oh this is not such a good piece this is simple this is this is a beginner piece why should i play this if, if it's a beginner piece why am i playing it totally. and over time this thing just changed in my mind so now i play a lot of lighter piece for my own entertainment, as well as to make people interested in the classical guitar. And sure. then once they hear those pieces and then they like those pieces, they are more open to hear more about the, I don't know, the more complex and less easy to understand pieces and repertoire. And it's great. You know, I think, I think you hit on, on to something that I, I really, I think we're really like-minded uh, about that. Uh, and I really believe believe in that what you just said which is we we get into our bubble uh especially like in a conservatory you know and in that conservatory if you show up on your like master's recital and play like romanza you know mm -hmm. people are like you think you're like, like you'd be left you know it's like playing free bird or something like it's like you know uh, or smoke on the water or something it's like kind of almost like a joke and now in the classical guitar world um and the, the, almost even the same thing with uh Asturias and Recuerdos de la Alhambra, like they're so overplayed that people, I remember like not wanting to play them. I didn't play them on mm -hmm. purpose because I thought these are overplayed and they're cheesy and cliche. Well, I feel you. The day I just learned how to play them and I was like, okay, why are these pieces so well loved? There's something about them. Just, you know, there's a combination of what, of what, how they sound on the instrument, how they feel to play that you're just like, oh, this is magic. Um, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not an accident that, that millions of people know these songs and don't know, I don't know, yeah, Invocation and Dance. Uh, I mean, like, these, these are these more esoteric pieces that, that are people who are really in the 
niche world listen to. But you have to come in somehow. And if if playing, I don't know, um, if playing a Bach fugue isn't going to get the, the people in the door and we want them in the door, then play the thing that's going to get them in the door so they can start appreciating. You know, uh, for me, it was Asturias and Recuerdos de la Alhambra that, uh, that definitely got me in. And if you, you could have played for me um, the most brilliant Bach composition uh, played the, the, in the most sophisticated emotional way, uh, and I wouldn't have understood it. I couldn't have, I, I wasn't ready to understand it. I couldn't appreciate the style. I didn't get it. And so I would just go, not interesting. But then you play right. Recuerdos de la Ombra, and I go, I don't understand. I've been playing guitar for 15 years. I've been playing all these rock solos, which I thought were so difficult. How are you playing two instruments at once? How does it sound <laughs> so beautiful, more beautiful than anything I've ever heard on a guitar? How? I have to learn how to do that. So it, it got me. Little by little, my ears opened up. My, I learned more music theory. I learned about different st- historical styles. And I, I learned to appreciate. I acquired the, a ta- the, the taste. It's a, it's a journey to get there. So I, I think there's this question about that you were getting at. Um, it took a long time to get there, sorry. But, but the idea is that, like, what should we be presenting to the masses, basically? And, and for me, it's, it's the thing that's going to get them in the door, you know? And I don't think we should feel bad about showing them beautiful pieces just because in our bubble, it's uh, common knowledge. Right, right. Fun fact. I started playing Talega after I finished my studies. So I haven't played Lagrima when I was a kid. I haven't wow. played, I don't know, Adelita. I, I haven't played any of these pieces. I started playing Talega after my final exam. Amazing. I think, no, 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 no. <laughs> sorry, I'm lying. Um, I played Recuerdos de la Alhambra during uh-huh. pandemic, but I didn't really have lessons you know, during that time. So I, okay. I was learning that, I don't know, it was, I was almost out of college that time. But yeah, so I, I started playing, I, I learned Lagrima after I finished my studies. I learned Adelita after wow. and Capriccio Arabe after I finished studies. And that's crazy how this, and, and yeah. people can't believe it. People don't believe that I haven't played these. They say, okay, these pieces are so strongly part of our, you know, our repertoire. How come I, I've never played that? I'm, mm. I'm lying about it. And I just, I just didn't. I just, I don't know, somehow I didn't. And I think while in classical guitar education, we are very busy to teach uh, very deep, very difficult, very complex music to our students, Sometimes you forget to just, you know, show these simply beautiful things because they are so obvious. They, we think that yes. it's so obvious and we just forget about them and we don't show them. You know, um, you, you tell me if this is if it's too much of a tangent, um, but but I, I feel so strongly about this, especially from being a teacher. Uh, I've taught as much as, as I've performed, um, uh, which is a lot. I mean, I've taught since I was like... Uh, 15. I was started teaching people of every ages. I taught people who were six all the way to 93, uh, and I have taught hundreds and hundreds of people in person, in group lessons, in like, it's a huge part of my life has been has been teaching. And the thing I've learned that has revealed a lot, I think, um, I have a f- interesting feeling about the classical guitar world from that perspective is that I think we're taught to be technicians, to be musical athletes. And that we have the impression that to be good is to say, look what I can do a little bit. Mm-hmm. And that's why you're constantly picking the harder, more esoteric piece, which is like super impressive. And also there's like a whole competition uh, vibe in the classical guitar world of like, what do you do after conservatories? Like you play competitions. That's how you can like make a career. That's like one of the paths people take. You know, it's like get, do competitions or get a, at a job at a, at a university. At least for me, that's in the, in the US, that's like, there's like the, one of the two main options. And I think competitions lead us down a certain path of repertoire, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, impressive. What's a competition winning piece, not what's beautiful. And what I've noticed from all my teaching and this competition culture is that I think the classical guitar world is in a bit of crisis in the sense that people are these incredible musical athletes, these technicians. But I'm surprised sometimes how when I, I, have, I see this like virtuoso, clearly virtuoso guitar player playing who can do anything. They can play the Bach Chacon perfectly. Um, uh, 
these pieces that I, I, I'll, I'll never be as good as them, technically. And then they play Lagrima. And to my shock, they play bum, 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 bum. Every note sounds the same. There's no phrasing. There's no singing out of the guitar. And I go, what has happened here? We, you, you can play anything you want, but there's absolutely no musicality in it. And I mm-hmm. think this is all too common in the guitar world. And so my advice to people learning classical guitar and to anybody who, who's, who's studying this is play the simple things. Beca- and this is what I do with my students. I always keep making them play simpler and simpler because if you can't play a simple sore etude or lagrima beautifully, why could you play uh, something that involves three voice counterpoints with imitation so well? I mean, you're getting the right notes at the right time. Congratulations. That's level one. All the beauty is when we transcend the technique and, and playing the right notes at the right time and get the musicality and singing out of the guitar. And, um, in recent lessons with students, I've been doing a lot of things like stripping things down. And if you're going to play Lagrima, and this is if something with technique that's causing you to, to play very choppy, the shifts, or worrying about squeaking or whatever it may be, I, I so often have people just sing the melody and play on one string, you know. And if you can't play that beautifully, why would adding more things make it more beautiful? It doesn't. Yeah, it how, how could it that harder. make it better? Yeah, it's, yes. it's actually making it harder. If I can't cook a sandwich, why could I do it on rollerblades and you know, while doing a somersault? Like, there's no way. So stripping it down and just playing the melody beautiful should be our, I think, is such a great exercise. And, and then everything you add on, the goal should be to not detract from the beauty of the, that, 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 how you've sculpted the phrasing. Um, it should sound the same. And then all the extra voices should make it more beautiful, not not less. Because what often happens is maybe I can play that nicely, but then the t- doing the rest makes it sound clumsy. And now suddenly I'm not legato in my melody. There's no vibrato. The, I, it sounds, um, yeah, choppy. So I think playing simple pieces is, is, the, is the best thing we can do for ourselves because I would rather play a simple piece beautifully than barely survive uh, through a piece which is 30 second notes for three minutes and it's, it's like wow that was super impressive but I went bop, 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 bop. I played like a, t- a typewriter you know for me that's mm-hmm. not why I do this anymore I, I don't, at the beginning I was about like fast shredding you know loud, like a <laughs> electric guitar stuff like that was why I was I thought it was cool <laughs> I got past that and now if it's not poetic and beautiful like what are we doing you know I'm so happy you brought this up yeah, there's so much value in what you just said, and I'm sure people will agree with, with you on it. And actually, it reminds me of a silly video I, I made maybe two years ago or one year year ago. It's more of um, It was a YouTube short comparing how what people think is hard on classical guitar, and it's, you know, a bunch of notes playing really fast and I think really I saw loud that. and a lot of things. And then what's actually hard is to play just one single melody Yes. in a beautiful connected legato way and and yeah and it went viral and people Congrats. are you know like they are they're having all kind of conversation under it because yes because it's not really that obvious i think we overlook we really really overlook this this topic i think is so important and um i guess the 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 phrase that I've been using lately with my students is, uh, I, I call it the dip down method. So, you know, you have these like really, uh, these music enthusiasts who want to play classical guitar, which is a really hard tech, technical instrument to play. And they want to get to play the most complicated. They want to play La Cathedral um, mm-hmm. by Barrios. And, and that's like why they got into classical guitar. And maybe they're like, you know, successful in their like you know their their business and they're like they're used to being very good at what they do and, like they're an adult and they want to play but they're starting from zero i often feel like this is the hardest student to teach because they 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 know what the good music sounds like they can appreciate it they can pick out the differences between good players but then them, themselves they can't realize it so they can't jump right to what they want to do and so very often i call it the dip down method where I have, I know you're here musically, you're listening here, maybe you have like a scale singing or on piano, but let's dip down to the basics and, and like basically make the foundation strong and we'll build upon that strong, mm-hmm. this, this strong foundation to get you where you want to be. But as, even though your listening skills and your piano skills are here, you can't just jump there. Even like the, the parallel to that same repertoire in classical guitar, you have to dip down, build it up, 
And I found with my students and myself that very often, if I feel like they're, they're not making progress, I just have them like, listen, I know you want to play this other uh, piece by Scarlatti or something, but let's just go, let's go down to Lagrima. I've taught that piece, I think, more than any other piece for classical <laughs> guitarists. It's, for me, it's the litmus test for musicality. If, if you can't play that piece well, then there's something going wrong, I think, in your playing. If that's not an incredible gem uh, uh, in your in your repertoire that you can play in a convincing way, then um, then everything else is just going to be less and less musical as you get more advanced. So very often I introduce that piece or Sore Etudes or even like Carulli or Giuliani or something, because when you have less to do, you should be able to use more of your musical energy and imagination to yeah that's to really right. sculpt a phrase and and know what you're doing mm -hmm. uh, i have this same experience with a few students and sometimes they come to me and they are quite skilled but um, their playing lacks you know this musical awareness or being able to lead the uh, the progression and what we usually do or what i usually try to do is to step back a little bit technically and you know i just try to to say, okay, let's step back and, and let's um, try to play something that's easier on the technique so they can focus on the musicality. Mm. And at first, some of these people, I don't know, like they don't react so welcoming in, in a welcoming way to this idea that I want to play fast, I want to play something difficult. And then I give them something more simple and at first they are not so happy about it but after the first lesson we spend a little time to create this atmosphere and to just i don't know this creative work together but i'm not just sitting there as a teacher telling them what to do and and how to do it but i'm just helping them to be able to listen more carefully and it's one of the best thing one of the best thing ever and i think my favorite thing about teaching is when i teach or when I get to talk about musicality. Because technique, I don't know, I, I like teaching technique a lot, but for me the, the biggest value has always been to talk about musicality and share what I, what I found out about that. Of course, I mean, because uh, the technique is a means to an end, and the end is the musicality, right? The end is to move the emotions uh, of, of mm -hmm. someone, yourself, and the person you're playing for. That's why we do this. Why we do this. Uh, if we were technicians, um, then maybe we'll be replaced by, you know, robots in a hundred years. But as long as we're poets, uh, then that is, there's no, you know, it's a human endeavor. So there's no in, there's no danger. Um, that's what we're doing. We're 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 reciting poetry. We're we're, we're storytellers, as mm -hmm. um, as my friend Rob McKillop put in in our interview I did it with him. He put it so poetically. He's, yeah, we're, we're just telling a story. And I, for a very long time, I've thought that way. Each piece is a little narrative. And I, I don't know, do you do the thing like you create stories in your head of like what, what's going on at this moment and Not in every single pieces, but f I don't know, for example, for Legnani Capriccio, I can, but for something right. very, I don't know, very fluid, it depends, it depends on the piece. But yeah, mm. I, I do, I can. Well, it's super, super helpful, and uh, for me, it gives a lot of meaning uh, to what we do, you know, and it makes it more explicit in your in your mind, kind of what you're going for. And more approachable, I think. Mu music gets more approachable if you, uh, if you're able to connect pictures to it, right? For me, I, I mean, otherwise, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's always this danger. There's always this danger of playing, I don't know, notes on a page, and and intrinsically, that's not. Um, emotional that's not that's not moving playing notes on a page isn't actually necessarily beautiful um it's how you play them right if i look back at my education one of the biggest problem was this uh, first of all this fear-based playing that i always tried to impress everyone that i had to be yeah. you know, i had to be better than two months ago i had to right. have this constant improvement and it had to be very measurable and very significant so mm -hmm. i started to play more and more difficult pieces and some of them are, are really technically challenging and i was i was never really happy with the skill i reached but over time you know i started to practice more and more longer for longer and longer hours i ended up practicing you know six hours a day but all the other stuff that should have come with it, like improvisation or, 
I don't know, composing simple or creating simple ideas from scratch or music theory, anything, you know, anything, or playing, um, playing baroque music or reading tablature, stuff like that, they were left behind. So my skills improved my and my knowledge didn't come with it. So it created this huge conflict that I felt like, okay, I'm a very good player and I'm a very bad musician because I have no idea what's going on. And I, I think, think there's a huge conflict in a lot of academic people because of this. And it's so frustrating. I was going to say exactly your, your sentence you just said. I think that's incredibly... Uh, prevalent feeling and I've been talking to people around the world about this and different classical tar programs this this is what I was talking about I think this is the crisis we're, we're in I think something has to change I, and for me the the thing that has to change um, is uh, I said this on another, another uh, podcast recently it was that it was about improvisation and, and like um, uh, playing continuo and and, and com composing and things like that I think that the missing link is that the reason like a lot of us don't feel like music like full musicians like we should we feel like like these musical athletes uh that's what the conservatories are kind of pumping out um is because we're not you have, you have these people who can yeah play the boxer cone from memory and flawlessly and then you say hey now play happy birthday or like you know in, in key of c major and they can't do it <laughs> uh it's like they know the tune and they can't play, like was give me the music you know this is a crisis uh -huh. i mean in in uh, in the for all of musical history until now, a good musician was someone who could improvise, compose, and play well. And you weren't worth your weight if you could only play well. It's like you mean you don't, you, what you're saying is you don't understand the music enough to play it yourself. And I think this is where I am with historical music, and this is where my my next big challenge is. I've been improvising so much over the last ten years in a historical context that I want to. I want to be able to recreate the pieces in the same way they were using the same formulas, partimento, basso continuo, things like this. And I think in the classical guitar world that there should be some level of improvisation uh, and composition built into a degree. But I remember my degree, they said, listen, you're a performance major. That's what you are. This person is a composition major. And it's mm -hmm. like, and those were not like, those didn't overlap. And I was like, people said, yeah. can you play your composition? And I would confidently say, no, no, no. I am a performance major, not a composer. This is a silly modern um, arbitrary distinction that I think if we if we were to do away with it, we'd have a lot better musicians in the guitar world. Who It's not that you have to write your own compositions, but you can. And if you can, mm -hmm. and that you can write quality compositions, it means you understand the music. So when you do play Brower and you do play Karkazi, you, you'll see the architecture within what they're doing, and there's some level of predictability, and you'll see what's so clever about it. But if you don't understand how they did it, then you're playing notes on a page. That's right. And in your school arpeggiato, do you have like any idea how to sort this out, or do you have any tools or systems how to, I don't know, change these things around a bit? Well, uh, I have teachers who are uh, Baroque specialists, early music specialists, Renaissance and Baroque, and, and they can improvise well and understand these these concepts, I, these concepts I was talking about, and so if you're somebody, if you're listening and you are interested in yeah improvising uh, or learning to play in early styles or something, then uh, or composing, we have teachers who or, who can compose, we have teachers who can improvise, uh, and you can study with them and learn how to do it. Um, for my courses, I definitely want to make a course on improvising. I'll probably do a YouTube video at some point, like kind of like giving a, a teaser do. for that. <laughs> yeah, because I Please. think people just all these talented classical guitarists who wish they could do it, um, and they, they, just, they just don't know where to start. They think either they have to play something as good as uh, Soar, or they shouldn't mm -hmm. do it. And that was my barrier. I thought, well, I, exactly. there's no way. Same, same for me. Exactly. Why would I? Why would I even try it if I can't? you know, bring something as valuable or as worthwhile into this world, it will never be as worthwhile as, I don't know, box music. So I, I shouldn't even, you know, waste my time on it. That's the feeling, but it's, it's, and it, I think it, that's exactly how I felt. Um, it's fun. It's fun and it can only improve you as a musician and it'll give you more insight. And if you can't think like a composer, then you won't play the composer's intentions well, because you just don't get it. You, you, I can recite, I can reci recite um, poetry in I don't know Japanese, uh, but it won't sound, it won't sound good. <laughs> It'll right. be very. I mean, even if I get the right vowels and the right consonants, and I, if I say the right things at the right time. Uh, it'll be a mess. It won't be emotionally moving. It'll be confusing, and native speakers will go, "What are you doing?" And 
and, and if I was to actually do that well, I'd have to, you know, immerse myself in how they speak. And um, I think that's what we're doing with, with composers. We're learning their language. And we have to immerse ourselves within it to the point where we could create our own poetry. Um, and if we can do that, then you, you really understand how to be a good actor, essentially. Mm -hmm. But you have to understand the language. And that for, the, for me, that means being able to improvise and, and compose a little bit. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, but also there's another thing that have helped me very, very recently a lot. And it has very little to do with, um, I don't know, with understanding and with theory and with, I don't know, just having or being knowledgeable about anything. And it was, it was in a book uh, I've read, uh, Effortless Mastery. And it had a little bit about improvisation. And it said the good improvisation uh, happens when you just play a note and no matter what you play, you just, I, I can't phrase it, I can't quote it, so I'm butchering it. But <laughs> it was about when you play a note, you, you own it. And no matter what you, note you play, you just, I don't know, you just bear it. Whatever you play, you bear it and you go with it. And you accept, no matter what you played, you just accept what happened and you're trying to go with that. And that was such a big game changer for me. And uh, it, I don't know, it helped me to dissolve the stress around improvisation or that uh, a lot of perception. Because, you know, sometimes when, when we pl play a piece of classical music, we have a lot of perception. And when you improvise, you have to let those perceptions go a little bit in order to be very present. And this simple idea that you just go from one note to another, and no matter what you play, you have to just live with it. You have to learn to live with that note. Yes. And that's it. And it's so helpful. So simple, so stupid, and so good. Well, it's the simple things that work, right? And I think that is the one... Um, I know we're spending a lot of time on this, but uh, maybe it's helpful yeah. for the listener. Um, we, can, we can transition right. if you have other questions. But just to, just a note, because I think it's so essential. The number one barrier to people's improvisations... Let me get settled here. <laughs> the number one barrier I find to, uh, especially classical guitars, improvisations, composition, is they think, if I'm going to improvise, it has to instantly sound as good as the pieces I play. It won't. It won't for 10 years. It won't for maybe your whole lifetime because these people lived in the style and they played one style their whole lives. And like, So I think just give that up. And instead, search for beauty and do it in the simple, the simplest way. Quality over quantity. Uh, I think for most classical guitarists, if you're used to playing, if you can play the Cathedral in a recital from memory, you have the, all the chops you'll ever need. So um, then you say improvise and you think you have to do something so crazy complicated. Well, uh -huh. don't. So my, I've been working with my students lately in improvisation and just searching for a chord and then pick a note in the scale and make a little motif. And then maybe play the chord again. And then repeat that motif, but with a little variation. It kind of sounds like a Rano has. Yeah. <laughs> and then change the chord to another chord in the key. And you can play the same same motif now, but now it has different meaning juxtaposed with the chord, and then simply go back and maybe end with a little scale. And you tell a little story, you know, a little narrative. And nothing I did was complicated just now. It's, it's how easy is? It's not the boxer cone, but it's pretty and with the chord. It's what the guitar does well. And so what you can do is you just pick a couple good chords, you find out how to play, in this case, A minor, D minor, E major, A minor. You find out how to play an A minor scale, or maybe with a sharp seven. And then you make little patterns that are, that are so easy. It's like a staircase. You go up one, down one, and back, you know? Mm -hmm. But it sounds beautiful. And if you play it well... With shape, you're singing out of the guitar. This is this sounds nice, and so I find a lot of meaning in doing three chords with little scales, and uh, from that you can build tenths with like you know like harmony, and you can get more complicated. But compli it's not a, it's not a virtue in itself to play something that's complicated. So simple pieces added up together make something beautiful. 
Start there and you'll see it's so much fun. And somehow when you do that enough, what I find is that if I improvise like that for a while and then I play some Giuliani, I go, oh, if he's in the same key, I did that. I did the same thing he did. (laughs) Because he's using the same instrument with the same shapes that work. There's idioms and things that sound good. And you're going to run into composers doing the same thing. Because like, oh, of course, because these tents work super well on a guitar. So no wonder Lagrima found that tents in this position works well, but also tents work well in, in, in any key because it sounds well on, on the instrument. So sorry for taking a while doing that, but just to say that this is, it's not hard. If you can play these advanced pieces, then this is easy, but you know, it takes some more musical understanding, but this is where so much meaning is waiting for you when you do simple things like that and understanding. Right. I think maybe the toughest thing is, is ego here, because if mm. you can play, you know, the, the most difficult pieces, um, even so, even though you're technically very skilled, being able to improvise is it requires a slight, a different skill set. Yeah. So I'm not saying that when you learn to play, uh, when you learn to improvise, you're starting from zero. Obviously, I'm not saying that, but you can't have the same expectations as with what you what you've been doing for ten or fifteen years yes. to be able to do just as well. And even though it's the same instrument, and you are sitting in the same way, and you are picking the same way you're doing something different and it requires time to, or it takes time to get used to it and to be skilled in it. And I think that might have be, or that, that might be the thing that um, makes some people uncomfortable. It is, but uh, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what's happening. And my, my, my recommendation is just start to a little bit, a little bit a day before include it in your warmups, you know, um, your warmups can become musical exercises. That's so good. Yeah. It's just, it makes it so much more fun. And and you feel like you did something very creative yeah. from the very second you picked up the guitar. You know who did you that know, super well? Uh, sorry, but just a, a, one thing I want to say is, you know who ahead. did that amazingly is um, uh, Roland Dienz. Uh, when, when he was alive and playing concerts, he's the only guitarist I ever saw who turned the entire concert into, into uh, poetry. I mean, even tuning on the guitar, just like it was... Uh, back in the Renaissance and the Baroque period with, with preludes uh, and toccatas that were meant to just kind of be searching for the key. And like they were tuning, there were chances to tune. You play a little thing in a key, you tune. It's like you're, you're getting in tune. He would, he would tune and make it a piece. And That's guitarists so today you use don't their digital really see tuners. That. Yeah, you don't see that too often. Yeah. He, I mean, he would uh-huh. start with a chord. Like if he was a little out of tune, he'd start with something. And he's just, he's, he's playing harmony and listening. Doesn't like that. So while still playing. And, okay, that sounds good. He'd be fixing things as he go, uh-huh. but he'd make it musical. I mean, that's like that's so awesome. incredible. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Huh. You know, yeah, I'm also getting very lazy with this tuner thing. I'm really guilty of that. And I love this idea. I love this idea a lot. So about the online course, what was the name of it again? My online course is called Classical Guitar Pro. It's classicalguitar-pro.com. I remember seeing that it was a collaboration with Dadario, maybe, or there was some kind of collaboration with Dadario around it. How was that? They helped me launch the course by uh, offering a free pack of strings for everybody who oh. signed up for like a specific uh, window. So that was really uh, great to collaborate with them on that. And uh, That's awesome. Yeah, it was super, super nice of them. And I think it uh, you know, uh, just was one of those things that made people feel more comfortable about, about uh, kind of like signing up for something that they're, you know, there's a bit of gambling going on with online mm-hmm. courses. And I think, I think it, it helped. So I was, yeah, I was grateful for that. Yeah, a little physical value additionally yeah. to the course yeah that's a nice idea and did you specifically pick the you know the strings the type of strings they offered or um basically I don't know, how, did, how did you find the right sets or what what were the sets um well i reached out to Dorario about it and uh and about doing some type of collaboration and they actually had a really good idea which was basically it led you to a form where you could you could pick uh like which tension you wanted oh. And I think there was like a limited type of, of sets, so I didn't get to choose the set. It was kind of like their normal 
um, one of their one of their more normal sets. They they give I can't remember which one at the moment. And then you just pick the the tension you yeah, prefer. Yeah, I see. That's so cool because you know strings are so personal. And I was just wondering how you guys could come up with a set of strings that you are happy to recommend to every single people who buy the course. But yeah, okay, now this makes a lot of sense. I mean, I would have I would have loved to do something like that. I've never done a, I've never collaborated with a string company in that way, but. Um, but you know they they they're known for a reason. They make really good quality uh, strings. So it's uh, I think I just trusted with you know if you're if you're starting a beginner classical guitarist uh, and you want a set of strings that you're not going to regret having, then you know companies like Dario are, are like you know a great way to start. After that, you know um, after you start, we all get super niche about our strings, the tension, the materials, and uh, you know within Dario they have lots of different string materials and types and you can you, you can you can search there um and each player that kind of finds their own preference about those things mm -hmm. but what's i think that's so important to do you know to search for just like trial and error luckily strings aren't that expensive packs of strings on for get for classical guitar like violinists like spend like hundreds of dollars oh yeah to place four Poor strings guys. yeah like cellists it's like, oh my god <laughs> five hundred dollars for a new set of cello strings it's like oh my god ten bucks 15 bucks for us, you know, you can try out a lot of strings over a year. When, when people ask, what strings exactly should I buy? What tension exactly should I buy? I say buy five sets of different string materials and tensions and just cycle through them and you will learn yeah. what works yeah, for you. Yeah, see for yourself. Yeah. Right. You know, now, as we were talking about a lot of things, how, you know, how uh, teaching, or how online videos and teaching can come together in the online space and how, you know, you have the online course, I was thinking about um, what, what do you feel about the limitations of online lessons? And if you have experienced any, you know, any big issues with it. Yeah, you know, uh, I've had so, much, so many conversations um, about the subject with with friends uh, over the last three years since since COVID started, when I started with my wife, we started Arpeggiato, uh, and we lived in the world of online teaching, not just for ourselves, um, but with all of through our teachers and, and students there. Um, I'm a huge believer in it. I think it was one thing 15 years ago, and it's a completely different thing now, with a good microphone and a good interface and a camera where you can see what's going on. Uh, an, an instrument that works well on the on the medium, it's 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 fantastic. It's amazing. I mean, a plucked instrument works super well, especially with like original sound on Zoom. You can you can really perceive a lot of the nuance. Dynamics, you lose a little bit. I can never quite get, but I think I'm I'm learning. Like okay, that I understand what that sounds like in real life now. With I've listened enough on on Zoom with lessons, um, but there are instruments that work work less like singing is a bit hard on zoom uh it's kind of there's some some issues with sustained instruments i think in the world of guitar and plucked instruments it is fantastic i can tell you that um i can tell you that i did a two-year ma two-year master's degree and then i did three years with my um with a teacher in spain uh on on zoom during covid doing like uh, early music lessons and i got more out of the the lessons on zoom uh in terms of how it transformed me and how much I learned. Uh, then I did in person with all the other, you know, the, the events. And there's no, I don't think there's anything um, wrong with the, the university experience in that, in that sense. It was, it was tr transformative and wonderful. My point is that like the fact that I can get as much information from uh, a teacher on Zoom with two hours a week it tells you something, you know, it works. Not just for, I was right. a student in that context and I got as much information. Um, and then as a teacher, I see my students, I, you know, we have recitals and things and I, I see my students growing and I've taught for 15 years before I taught on zoom. So, uh, I see the same progress. So mm -hmm. my conclusion is it totally works. There is definitely a uh, bias against it. Everyone has this intuition that this is somehow lesser, uh, than, than, uh, in-person lessons and should cost less and all these things. And I just completely disagree through, through experience on both sides. I think it's incredibly valuable and actually it's better in many ways because there's no commute you can in easily record the whole lesson with no by not bringing a camera into the lesson right um you can save it rewatch which is essential for lessons you know half the lesson goes over your head because it's too much information usually um you can easily share your screen show the things submit give each other files um in terms of limitations i think the biggest limitation is i can't touch the person 
um, in, in my lessons before I would, I would, I'd move their hand in a certain way or I'd adjust their, their posture. What I found though is, is I've replaced that just by being more articulate, uh, learning how to say what you want and stop saying, do this. You just have to say, what is that thing? I, Indirectly you know. improves other skills, like, you know, being more articulate with what you want to say. That's so cool. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm, I'm also a huge believer of online lessons. I don't have cool. uh, in-person lessons anymore at all. I completely Same. transitioned to online lessons because I see them. I see a lot of value in them. I see how well they can work. So I, I'm also a huge believer. I wanted to talk just very briefly about your online course a little bit mm. because I have this little issue with my videos that every time I make a video about a topic it's so permanent it's you know it's made and that's how it is forever and someone pops in the chat or in the comment section saying oh I wish you mentioned how this or that works and I'm like damn it <laughs> and I have to live with that forever. <laughs> and there's no way to go back. And with online yeah. lessons, you know, the next, if you, if you, I don't know, come up with an idea after the lesson, next week you say, hey, you remember when we were talking about this or that? Well, I had this idea which might work for you. Let's have a look. And then you go through, go, go over it again. But with videos, it's just so per permanent. And... I was wondering if you ever felt the same with your online course, that you said things, you missed things, and you just have to learn to live with it. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, the big challenge with an online course is that you are uh, speaking to such a wide audience. I mean, in my beginner course, for example, um, I, I'm, I'm speaking to two main audiences, people who have no experience at all ever playing an instrument, and this is their first time picking up a guitar, and I have to make the course... I wanted to make the course um, accessible for them. And I found with a lot of online teaching, and even in-person teaching that I've observed, observed, I find that people really go like this. They go, here, it's easy, step by step. And then at some point there's this happens and then you just mm -hmm. lose everybody. And my goal in my teaching has always been to like really take people step by step so that you can, you can anybody could do it. And so in the course, I wanted to do that. So you can play your first recital at the end of like six pieces and having never touched an instrument in your life. At the mm -hmm. same time, I wanted the course to be accessible for people like me when I was uh, 16 starting classical guitar, which is I'm, I was actually uh, a good rock guitar player. I could really shred on the guitar. I had all the left hand technique I needed uh, to play the pieces, but I had to learn how to do the right hand. I had to learn about nails. I had to learn about reading music. So I wanted the, the course to also be the, the easy um, transition for those people into the classical style and give them what they want. So how do you balance those two things? I mean, ideally it'd be two separate courses, but I made the course mm -hmm. in a way that it's kind of good for everybody. And I, and I designed it for that, for that purpose. So, um, I kind of covered my bases. I spent like six months preparing that course and like working through the details and like, oh, like uh -huh. a puzzle, making it work with the pacing. Uh, and that I think has been successful. I've, I've had, um, just over 1,300 people take the course now, and I've got a lot of feedback. Oh, congrats. Uh, thank you. I'm super happy about that. And I'm watching people. They submit their videos. We have like a private Facebook group that you can like get my feedback in, in the group. Mm -hmm. And they, they say, I never play guitar. And then three months later, they show me them that a video of themselves playing uh, a piece by Aguado, and they're, they're doing it. And I'm like, oh my God, you mm -hmm. learned that entirely from this course. It clearly oh, works. That's wonderful. Uh, so that yeah. I find, so that's why I, that's why I find it so meaningful. I'm going to do more of this. But um, the limitation is that I can't customize the, in the moment for the right pacing for that person. So I, that's why I try to structure the course in a way where there's options to kind of like go through it. And also using uh -huh. the speed, the speed button to, to work through things. Um, so the limitations are just that, that you're speaking to such a wide audience that as a viewer, you, you, you aren't getting the, exactly the customized approach, which is why I also have the school for people who want absolute customized lessons. Right. Then you have one-on-one, -on -one, which is, of course, is the fastest way to learn, right? To have someone watch what you're doing yeah, and say, this is the Yeah, but that takes problem. the most responsibility as well from, yes. you know, from the viewer's perspective. Financially and with their time. They have to agree to a certain time a week. Uh, and they and it has to be at this time, and it costs a bit more to do in-person lessons. Online courses, the advantage is it's, it costs less, and whenever you have five minutes, you, you do it. So my point is, I want to give all the all the options. So like, if you want to learn classical guitar, like this, like pick it. So free online content, 
If that's all you're ever going to do, there it is. If you want to go deeper and learn at your own pace, here's the course. And if you really want the custom tailored lessons, here it is. So like, I want, I'm trying to cover all the bases of like, whatever way you learn, here are, here are the options. And I think each one has its own uh, limitations, right? But I'm, I, as you can tell, I'm just absolutely convinced that the future of online learning is it's, it's a wonderful. It's opening up so many doors for people and I can reach so many more people than I ever would have reached in person. That's beautiful. That, sound, that sounds great. And uh, yeah, I just can't wait to see more videos you produce and thank you and to see this whole thing coming together well i'm excited too i mean it's a really amazing thing to uh i feel very lucky to be able to you know do this uh and it's uh super rewarding so so yeah thanks All for right if you sorry if you would have now this you just said reminded me of a question i wanted to ask um if you could tell something to your younger self if you can could go back and give an advice to your younger self what would it be i would say yeah start uh, uh in terms of being a better musician i would say when i switched from rock playing rock bands to classical guitar i would say never stop uh, writing songs and improvising uh, that's the first thing because my, my, I stopped doing that and I only played classical guitar pieces for two degrees, uh, and my, my, uh, improvisation skills atrophied. I just, I forgot how to do it. And I had to relearn that in my, my sort of doing professional, um, early music, uh, professionally. Uh, so number one, never stop improvising and, and composing and things because that is, I think is the core of being a good musician, no matter what instrument you play. The, the instrument's a tool right mm -hmm. musician music, uh, music lives up here and and uh, the the instrument is just a way to get to get there so as a musician that would be my advice um for youtube my advice would have been to start doing educational content sooner um and right and yeah sticking to your authentic self and just just produce content that you find meaningful it's like you know what youtube is for me it's kind of like you said uh earlier it looks like i'm just kind of um uh, having fun explaining something that I like, that's because for me YouTube is is a it's a show and tell. It's look at this cool thing. Have you seen this? Like I haven't introduced my YouTube channel to this beautiful guitar yet. This is a 19th century replica. I love it. There's so much to say about it. Uh, I'll, I'll skip it now. But I am so I just love this, and I want to show people and say, Have you seen this? Isn't this beautiful? Here's what to love yeah. about it. And for me, that's what YouTube is. And uh, uh -huh. that's what I love about doing it is saying like, do you know about this? This is so cool. This is what you might like about it. If you want to learn more about it, this is how you do it. And so um, that's so important. And so I, I would have said to myself, do, start doing that sooner. I was petrified of talking on camera, actually. That's one of the reasons I never, um, I never did it. I was, I was very scared. I thought I had nothing to contribute. Mm -hmm. um, I thought people, why would I do a video on changing strings? People have already made that video. Um, people have Say, said it better than me. We just talked about it, yeah. Yeah, so I was like, why would, why would, I have nothing to add. Uh, I didn't like my own voice. Uh, I thought it was very inarticulate. And then like, I, I, people have done this better than me. Why would I even try? And I started doing it and I got a really nice reaction. And uh, so I just haven't stopped. So yeah, so th those are the kind of the, the things I would, I would say to my former self. I think we're also happy you changed your mind and you started <laughs> producing those videos. Yeah, Thanks. thank you so much. I'm, I so enjoyed this talk. This was great. And thank you. Thank you for joining me today. Me too. Thanks so much for having me.